Hey guys, my name is Sam Willis. I'm the senior lecturer for the Australian Paramedical College. And in today's lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about vital signs surveys. So you will hear a lot about this throughout your studies with the college. And today's session really does touch on what we classify at the college as vital signs surveys. We'll be, we will be talking about when to do them, how to do them. Although this is not a practical demonstration of these, it really does allow you to put the vital sign surveys into context of what you'll be doing at the clinical face-to-face -face workshops. So let's start by um, talking about the, the sessions of the, the end of the session. So here we can see, um, we're gonna help you guys recognize the importance of undertaking vital signs assessments in the context of being a paramedic, wherever that may be. Now I say wherever that may be because today's paramedics don't just work on state ambulances, they work on mine sites, they work for event medical companies, and in a whole range of, of complex places, wherever there's an emergency response required. So we're going to look at the importance of undertaking a vital sign um, assessment, because it really does underpin what you do as a paramedic and how you form your treatment plans. We're going to be looking at the different assessments that form a vital sign survey. We're going to talk about when to do it, because this can be just as complex as how to do it, particularly given that the patient um, is only one part of the system. Remembering you've got to try and fit it in with what you're seeing, what you're hearing, as well as working together as a crew and being flexible as a crew. And of course, we're going to recognize a range of vital signs considered to be within normal limits. So what this means is we're going to take a look at some of the, the common vital sign values and discuss what, what are considered to be normal. Okay. So exactly what constitutes a vital sign is subjective. So you're gonna be hearing the word vital sign, vital sign, vital sign over and over again, both in your readings and at the practical workshops. But what you will notice if you stop and take a look at what other ambulance services and other medical services do, you'll notice that what one service considers to be a vital sign is not considered to be a vital sign by another service. And you know what? It actually doesn't matter that much because we tend to consider the vital sign as any type of assessment around the physiological um, output. So for example, respiratory rate, heart rate, blood sugar, those types of things. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. I suppose this first point is just making you aware that vital signs is a subjective term. Broadly speaking, a vital sign is a measurement of a physiological function such as heart rate. So we've already said that. Um, and undertaking a vital sign helps the paramedic identify any abnormal physiological responses due to illness or trauma. So if we're going to use heart rate as the example here, just to exemplify this third point, imagine somebody who's in a state of, of, of physical or clinical shock. Now, as you guys will know, the heart rate goes up as a way of compensating for whatever's occurring in the body at that moment in time. So you can see that by monitoring that heart rate, something as simple as palpating a radial pulse or even a carotid pulse and taking that vital sign recording will help you to work out, you know what, this is not normal. This is, this is an abnormal vital sign. Vital signs allow the paramedic to use a process of differential diagnosis. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, differential diagnosis helps you to rule out what something is and isn't working. So for example, if, um, if I've got a patient with chest pains and I'm trying to work out, is this caused by heart or respiratory? So let's say they describe it as tight, gripping, radiates down the side, left arm into the jaw. Uh, it doesn't change when I breathe in or out or move. Uh, I can absolutely rule out respiratory problems. So that's differential diagnosis. You're differentiating between the different conditions. Exactly when to undertake a vital sign survey should be agreed upon by the ambulance crew and depends on the patient situation. Now, what this means is, yes, by all means, go running in and do your vital signs at the most appropriate time. Generally speaking, we introduce ourselves, we go through the primary survey, danger response, airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. That's primary survey. Then we do your secondary survey. So that's your pain assessment, your vital sign surveys, your history taking, and your head to toe survey if the trauma is suspected. But you have to try them, do, do them at the time that's appropriate. So there's a lot of communication between you and your crewmate, there's a lot of team working here, and there's a lot of decision making as to what's, what's the most appropriate. So, for example, if somebody, if your patient is laying on the floor looking cold and clammy, and their partner tells you they're diabetic, 
you're going to go and do a blood sugar test pretty quickly rather than doing the thermometer test to check the body body temperature so you have to apply a little bit of decision making here Okay, common vital signs then. This is what we, we have decided to be common vital signs here at the college. Cardiac characteristics, respiratory characteristics, body temperature. So we're talking about the core body temperature, not the peripheral. There's a difference between the two, which we'll discuss in a moment. Blood glucometry and blood pressure. So these are the skills that you will be taught, as well as other skills, when you arrive at the face-to-face -face clinical work workshops. Okay, so cardiac characteristics then. Now notice we haven't just put heart rate because it's not as simple as just palpating the radial pulse or putting a SAT probe on the finger and doing the, um, the, the heart rate. You have to actually palpate the radial pulse. You have to feel for the absence or presence of the radial pulse. So when we're talking radial, we're talking round about here, you know, at the wrist. So we're looking to see if it's present or absent. If the radial pulse is not present, you feel for the carotid pulse, which is on the neck. We tend to avoid going straight for the neck because it's very delicate in that area. So if the radial pulse is absent, but your patient's conscious and talking, do say to your patient, I need to feel your neck to feel your heart rate. Is that okay with you? And then go and feel for the carotid pulse. It's as simple as that. What you're feeling for, apart from the absence and the presence, is the rate, in other words, how fast it is and how slow it is, the regularity, so for example, what's the distance between each contraction? Is it equal or is it not equal? And of course, you're feeling for the strength as well. Sometimes the strength can be, um, it can be determined just by palpating. Um, so for example, it's a full bounding pulse is not always a good thing because it means your heart's having to, comp to, to squeeze and compress harder. So typical types of things that will affect your heart rate include infection, shock, um, drugs, stimulants drugs. So it's drugs that will speed your heart rate up as well as slowing your heart rates down. Typical stimulant drugs that speed your heart rate up include cocaine and ecstasy. And typical drugs that slow your heart rate down include heroin. And of course, there are some some uh, prescribed medications that will slow your heart rate down and speed it up as well. And a typical tablet uh, medication that will slow your heart rate down as prescribed are beta blockers, which is what the elderly use or anybody uses to control blood pressure. So if you do have somebody who's taking a beta blocker type medication and they've got a slow heart rate, it's probably normal because that actually is a side effect of the, of the, of the drug itself. Now, we haven't mentioned a lot about um, saturations yet, uh, but absolutely oxygen saturations are in that list as well. Now oxygen saturations, I think it's timely to talk about this here, is a little probe that you place onto the patient's finger. And not only does it give you a reading in a percentage, but it also calculates the heart rate. Now typically speaking, um, a normal oxygen saturation reading is anywhere between 92 and 96% according to the Australian and New Zealand Thoracic Society. So what that means is, any type of, any time a patient presents with an oxygen saturation below 92%, then they are considered as being hypoxic and they require oxygenation through the use of oxygen masks. Now let's talk about respiratory characteristics. So very similar to the cardiac characteristics, we're looking to see if breathing is absent or present. And again, if somebody is unconscious, but breathing, you really do need to do a thorough and systematic respiratory system assess assessment. Remembering that the breathing pattern, there's an inspiration and an expiration. So there's always two phases to the inspiration and that, to, the, to the respiratory cycle. When you're checking the respiratory system um, the characteristics, you're looking at absence or presence, you're looking at the rate, a normal, uh, respiratory rate should be between 12 and 20 breaths per minute. You're looking to see if there's any use of accessory muscles. In other words, in normal quiet breathing, breathing is controlled by a number of processes which includes um, pressure on the outside in the atmosphere and the low pressure on the inside. And there's a change in those atmospheric pressures inside and outside as you breathe. It's also controlled by, by mus the muscular system. And at no point should there be any accessory muscle uses 
that are really pulling your rib cage upwards and outwards to allow breathing to occur. It should all be nice and relaxed and, and um, in a controlled manner. You are also taking a look at the chest and looking at the respiratory pattern. In other words, does one side go up in, diff in a different matter to the, uh, to the other side or are they coming up, moving up simultaneously, nicely like, like that together at the same time as well as falling, so inspiratory and expiratory. And then finally, we are considering, ad considering added sounds. Now, later on, you'll be taught how to chest auscultate using a stethoscope. In other words, putting the stethoscope onto the patient's chest and listening for the added sounds. Um, but it goes outside the, this, um, this lecture to be covering those. But you do need to consider added sounds when you're doing a respiratory system assessment. And by added sounds, all we mean is any type of sound that is not air. One of the other more really useful um, vital signs is the temperature. Now we consider normal temperature to be between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees Celsius. Now this is really, really important because let's say for example, you call to somebody with chest pains. You're gonna get a lot of that in the state ambulance services. Um, you'll also get a lot of that wherever else you work in because you know, it's a common presentation. Now let's say the person describes their chest pain as sharp and stabbing and it, it's, it's sharp and stabbing and it's, it's worse when I breathe in. Now, using a thermometer to be able to, um, to take the core body temperature is crucial because for me as an experienced paramedic, if somebody tells me their chest pain is sharp and stabbing, I'm going to immediately think some kind of chest infection, maybe pleurisy, maybe just maybe pneumonia, maybe some other type of chest infection where there's um, um, an inflammation of the lungs somewhere. But the temperature really is the, the piece of equipment that's gonna help me to really de determine that that's really the cause. Now on the workshop, you'll be able to learn how to use this and all you really do is put a probe over the cover. Sometimes you have to turn it on, do a bit of tra tragus tug, pull the ear upwards, place it into the ear canal, press the button and it gives you a nice core body temperature. Now when I touch my forehead like this or touch my peripheral peripheries, that's what we call the peripheral temperature. But the good thing about this, core, this temperature, the, the thermomic temperature, is that it's recording the core temperature. So it's a really good piece of kit to measure the body's internal temperature. Now, blood glucometry is also a really, really important um, assessment task that you will use. Now, a normal blood sugar level should be on or above four millimoles per liter. Now, you do have to use this in a really careful and considered way. So for example, using the previous case study I gave, if your patient is laying in a semi-comatose state and they're pale and sweaty and clammy, once I've done my primary survey, which will involve airway, breathing, circulation, I may need to give them some oxygen first, I may need to put an oropharyngeal airway in their mouth if they're unconscious. One of the next things I will do is to do a blood glucometry assessment because in my experiences and through the text that I've read and all the learning that I've done, I know that patients with low blood sugars do present in a cold, clammy, um, aggravated state. So once you've determined that the blood sugar is below four, then you can actually treat it. Now, some texts will tell you that a, um, a sugar above 10, a blood glucose level or blood sugar level above 10 should also be treated. But pre-hospitally, the typical treatment for hyperglycemia is really sodium chloride, which will allow you to dilute the sugar if your service allows you to do it and it's in your scope of practice. Now, treating with, with sodium chloride, as I've said, does dilute the sugar, but it also allows the, the replacement of fluid as well, because these patients are usually um, dehydrated because they're excreting a lot of sugar. And then blood pressure. Blood pressure is a really, really important skill to have. And it's a, like, like all the other skills we're talking about here, it's a skill that you will develop over time. Now, typically, uh, a, a blood pressure is 120 over 80. 120 is what we call the systolic blood pressure, with systole just meaning contractions, um, and diastole, which is your AT or your diastolic blood pressure, meaning relaxation. Now, these guidelines are, are, ready, are up for changing at the moment, so it could be that this changes into the future. Now, a low blood pressure is considered to be 90 millimeters of mercury. Um, this, that's what MMHG stands for, millimeters of mercury, and that's just the, uh, the, uh, the pressure reading. 
Um, but it's not as simple as just saying, yep, 90 is a low blood pressure, because it, of course it depends if the patient presents with symptoms. Many of us do automatically have low blood pressures, but our bodies tolerate it. You just have to remember here that every single organ you have needs a certain amount of pressure to push the blood into it, and that's called the mean arterial pressure. So if, you're, if your patient's got a blood pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury and they're fine and they're living their life, then that's not really low for them. So you have to not just treat the numbers, but treat the whole patient. Now, a high blood pressure, according to the Royal Australian Colleges of GPs, is considered to be 140 over 90. Um, so anything over 139 over 89 is considered high. And again, there's different types of high. So in the context of patient assessment, you wouldn't go rushing this patient under blue lights to hospital, but instead you'd ask them lots of different things in their, in their history. Okay, so what we've done in this session is recognize the importance of undertaking vital signs assessments, help you to identify the different types of assessment involved and form, uh, form the vital sign surveys, know when to do it, that's the work in progress with your crewmate and your patient, and recognize a range of vital signs considered to be within normal limits. Now, of course, with all of this, there is an expectation that you do undertake your own readings and you get lots of practice in the skills labs when you arrive at the college and try not to be a passive um, participant, I'd be an active participant when you get to the college. Hope you've enjoyed the session and I look forward to connecting with you again in another session. Thanks.